do that again using this one that I started before. It does not have to be perfectly symmetrical. The historically accurate pieces, unless they were cast, are usually not perfectly symmetrical. Even the cast ones, a lot of times, are not perfectly symmetrical. to reshape it a little. I like to get them reshaped before I put them on. It just makes it easier rather than trying to work with a completely pulled together brooch that is now lopsided in some way. <laughs> you can wind up messing things up that way. This is a smooth one. I'll leave it be. Take another little teeny bit off there. A lot of practice on this. <laughs> so there's a tendency to make the pins just a smidge too long. So those will go into tumble. And the other thing I'm going to do this afternoon is reshape some of these cast pewter pieces. Now these are Thor's hammers. Anybody who's been watching the Thor movies knows this is Mjolnir, Thor's hammer, which was magic. <laughs> Peter is very soft and malleable, so I can shape it quite a bit without risk of it cracking. Has it ever cracked? I don't think so. It may have, but I sure don't remember when. I have cracked a piece before, but not using these guys. As I say, they are malleable, but all metal has their limitations. Now you can see what I've done is I have, this is the way it starts out. It's a little rough here because this is not a, perfect cast piece. I've hammered it flatter, which makes it shinier. And then I've hammered 
this part from the side, which broadens it out. See that? I'll shape this on the wet wheel. I could do it on a with a pair with a file here. It won't hurt anything. There we go. I just rounded that a little bit. I'll drill a hole through here. I'll mark it with a with a center punch so that the drill bit won't skitter. And I'll drill a hole through there. And then I'll take this and take it on the wet wheel. Some of these sections like here, you can't really get in with the wet wheel very well. So in the spots where you can't really get in there, I'll get in there with a file like this and file that down. I'll decide what the shape is going to be depending on each individual one is, you know, like when I hammer them, it changes the shape of the piece. And I'll decide how symmetrical I want it to be and all that sort of thing. If I want to, once it's pretty well cleaned up, do this by hand just so I can show. This is sort of faster to do on a wet wheel because I could take all the flashing, which is that leftover bits of metal on the edges, off with a wet wheel in about, you know, 0.2 seconds. <laughs> but, as I said before, a lot of this can be done and I can, by hand, and I do do it by hand if I need to do this at events. I try and go with as much of this kind of work done at home as possible so that I can focus my efforts at events on custom string, jaw, string work and, and earrings and things like that that people want. You know, I'll have a necklace and somebody will say, gee, I really like that. Could you make me a pair of earrings to go with it? And of course the answer will be if I have the particular pieces and I generally know what I have in stock. So there we go. It's shaped out a bit better now. I don't like the asymmetry there, so I will fix that. By the way, these were very, very frequently asymmetrical. We have a thing about symmetry modernly, which is not as important a lot of times in hand manufactured things. And I have to kind of walk a line between making it totally authentic and making it happy for modern people. Okay, so at this point, I have options as to what I do with it. I can uh, peen it the same way I did with this on the uh, brooch. I can use stamps. I have under my, <laughs> under my box of other things I'm working on. <laughs> A pile of stamps that have different shapes to them. And I could decide to put marks on here. So I could decide that I wanted let's pick something reasonable here. I could decide I wanted circles on it, and that's a circle punch. This one I bought from a company that no longer exists. I know how to make these, and I have made them before. They just happened to have a particularly nice example one time when I was there. So I bought it. <laughs> Sometimes you got to do that. It's just a little easier. Now, you'll notice I am not using my ball, my ball peen hammer. My ball peen hammer is steel. The face on that, I have an alarm going off. Okay. There you go. The face on that should not be used to strike other steel. This is tool steel. It has been hardened and softened. And what I mean by that is, in other words, is you, you want this hard, but you don't want it so hard that it's brittle. So I would not use this to hammer on it. I will use a soft-faced hammer. Now, what could happen if I was using a steel hammer? Uh, this, the face of the hammer could chip. This is a copper-headed hammer. 
I also have another one over here. I have several sizes of these. They are brass headed hammers. And you can see it gets all scarred up and stuff. And that's just fine because that means it doesn't damage the tool steel. So all I do is put it in place and whack it. This is a very common design. It's a very easy type of punch to make. There we go. And now I have little circles all over there. I could even put one more up here on the handle of the hammer. There we go. And now that will simply get drilled and polished the same as the other ones. I sometimes will, yeah, this is another one that's been peened. It hasn't been, had the flashing taken off on it yet. But see, this is one that I peened to create that dappled effect on it. Let's see, this has a slightly shorter handle. The natural process of casting will produce slightly, slight variations. And I'm not concerned about them all being identical because I want to be able to easily make variations on the theme, sort of, when I'm creating designs. And I'm trying to center the hammer, sort of, handle. There we go. Don't want it too bent. <laughs> Tap, tap, tap. Okay. Now on this one, I could do the same thing where I clean it up. This is lead-free pewter in uh, Viking times. I make these because they're inexpensive, and the equivalent in Viking times would have been made out of real lead. I do not work with real lead because of the problems with state laws, because I sell across state lines, and I sell in different states around the United States, and each different state has their own lead laws. So, I also am not really interested in ingesting lead. This is a pretty non-toxic, it's mostly tin. Doesn't mean you should consume large quantities of tin, because that's got its own issues, but I'm careful. I always wash my hands before I eat and things like that. Now, there's another one that's all shaped and ready to go. And I could choose to do a different de decoration on that one. Let's see. Put this guy back. We don't want to misplace him. That's a triscale. A triscale is uh, a three pronged star. I mean, it's just three pieces, but it's kind of a cool design. I think I'll put a little triscale on there. See if anybody likes that. I try and have a variation in designs available for people. Because people have all kinds of tastes. And it's not quite as deep as I want it to be, so I'm going to reset it back into its hole. So I can get it into the hole. This is not a perfect stamp. I bought it. I might just leave it the way it is. Let's see. See if I can do this without screwing it up. <laughs> if I screw it up, there's a solution. There we go. Yeah, 
There we go. That came out pretty good, actually. So it's a little triskel in there. And then I might put a couple of other triskels on here, just as a sort of a counterpart to it. But I'll hit it harder this time. <laughs> so I don't have to go back and reset it. There we go. So we have three triskels across here. And let's put one on the handle. There we go. Ta-da! And over time, the depressions on here will tend to darken up and you'll get more contrast. You could put blank ink or black paint in there if you wanted to make it instantly dark. And that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Hope you find that sort of interesting. It gives you an idea of all the crazy stuff I do around here. Uh, I also probably need to make some brooches that have words on them. Do that sometimes. Let's see. Have some blanks here. These have a sort of a swirly pattern on the back, and they can be stamped on the front with letters. And I have a collection of save, uh, say, uh, the sayings. Uh, Semper ubi sub ubi, which means always wear underwear. Amor vincit omnia, which means love conquers all. Milsev, uh, uh, this is what I'm not even going to guess how to say it. It's a combination of Latin and French, and uh, they did some pretty strange things in the 1400s. So, uh, since neither my Latin nor my French are all that wonderful, I have a, an assortment of sayings that I can stamp onto the, these things and turn them into brochures that work essentially the same as these do. They'll have a pin on them, but not today. <laughs> so, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell because obviously I have lots more to do. And uh, you'll probably see me down here quite a bit in the next couple of weeks because I got stuff to do before we go. So, until next time, bye. And keep on brainstorming because obviously I do. <laughs>